Good evening, I'm Robert Anthony Gibbons. Welcome to another edition of When Humanists Attack. I'm here with my co-humanist, Miguel Barrios. Say good evening, Miguel. Hello, everybody. My name is Miguel Barrios, and I'm very happy to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Um, we are, uh, uh, When Humanists Attack is an organization based in Vermont, and we are here in the New York City area to showcase not only talent here in the New York City area, but around the world. And tonight, we are going to showcase talent of three of our fellow friends. I just want to say a little bit about When Humanists Attack. When Humanists Attack are catchers of wild dogma, the lighters and defenders of all human beings, and we hope to be your place where you can think of yourself, not by yourself. So tonight, we're going to interview Luis Romero, Miguel Anaya, and my dear friend, Thomas Fucolaro. And we will start with our co-host, Miguel Barrios. Miguel, it's up to you. Uh, hello, everybody. So I'm very, very I'm thrilled to have my, my friend Luis Romero here, um, invited to this to the show. Uh, how are you tonight, Luis? Hey, how are you, Miguel? Thank you so much for having me here. You guys, it's an honor. Really appreciate that. Okay, so I'm gonna do a, a brief introduction of Luis. Um, Luis is also a journalist. Uh, uh, from Barranquilla, Colombia, and he studied sculpture at the Escuela Distrital de Arte and, Tra and Popular Traditions. He was the winner of the 10th uh, Salon de Arte Joven de la Bienal Internacional de Arte de Suba, Colombia. And, and also he has been in, he was, he had a very outstanding participation in the Festival of International of Caribe in Santiago de Cuba, Cuba. Um, besides, Luis have had expositions at the Art Students League in, in New York City, and currently he's, he's part of the Art Students League. So, um, so the, the first question that I have for Luis is, um, how was the beginning of your life as an artist? Well, I have been painting since I was, but when I was like, nine or ten, I took classes at the Atlantico University in my city in Barranquilla with an amazing teacher. Her name was Carmen Sierra Duarte and she helped me a lot. She teach me how to find my own voice, my style. As and, you know, I'm so thankful with her because all that I know now pain is thanks her that's 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 wonderful and uh, so and what is I, I have seen many of your artwork and i'm very very happy with seeing your artwork it's it's very moving it shows a lot of of the caribbean uh traditions of colombia so besides that what are the sources of your inspiration for that Well, I'm from the Caribbean coast, so we have a lot of cultural manifestations. I can know more about those manifestations, and all of those appear after some conflicts in Colombia. In my paintings, the resilience capacity is from Colombia, because, you know, sometimes we are discriminated here or in any country because we are from show to the people a different phrase from our country. I wanna show the beauties of our cultural traditions and of our, our animals. I try to combine all of those characters and make situations that talks better about our country. Great, that's great. So I see that in your artwork, you mix uh, geometrical figures with figurative art, and also they seem like kind of abstract figures. Uh, how is that process of creation for you? Well, first I got the idea, and that's something that I can't explain because I don't know how I got the idea. You know, I can be 
walking and I just got the idea. But when I'm trying to do something, I can. I just got the idea when I was. So after that, I try to make it because it's, if I don't do that, I can lose the idea. Right, um, right exactly. And after that, I uh, try to find some pictures that help me to do that. I start with a draw in the canvas and, and, and after I make the draw, I try to find lines and shapes in the middle of the real figures. And also when I'm painting, I'm trying to find some abstract shapes in the middle of the characters. The character, the background is the last thing that I paint. Mm -hmm. Awesome, that's awesome. So we want to see one of the paintings of Luis that shows a lot of his of his uh, um, of his uh, artwork. I, I I wonder if uh, we can see that you can see it right now. Okay, so so we are going to see one of your paintings. It's one of uh, uh, my favorites, and we want to see. Um, what is the name of this painting? It's the painting with the with the, this woman peeling the skin of the of the fish. So, what is the name of the painting? Is escamando in Spanish? It's like putting. In it. it was yeah. a situation that you know I was working as a journalist. That is in the middle of a lake. And all the people who live there are fishermen. And I saw that woman doing that. And I was so fascinated with the world. And it looks like something surreal. So I took some photos. I did some videos. And after that, I decided to paint her. So, so we, I hope that we can see the painting and, and we, can, we can enjoy this painting. Soon, I, I guess it's gonna be seen soon. Oh, okay, 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 good. So, so as you see in this painting, there are many geometrical figures, and also they can. It shows um, uh, several uh, it, hues of same colors, and and you you can see that it's a woman peeling the 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 scales of a, of a fish. And also there are, there are many things around that, that painting. I, and, and I really enjoy that because, because it's, it's, a, it's a strong tradition and you need to be very skillful to do it by manually to peel the scales of a fish and, and don't cut yourself in the, in the process and to do that. But, but I, what, I, I, what I see that, that you could transmit a lot of energy in that painting, and uh, so, so, uh, so. What what else can you tell tell us? And uh, where is that painting now? And uh, is that collection? Uh, where is it? Yeah, it's in a private collection there in Colombia. Someone loved the paint. Okay, uh, and bought me the painting there. Um, and yeah, you know, I try to show that I, when I saw the situation, I, especially what you said, the scales and how the scales mix with the hands and the water where they had the feet. So it took me a lot of time, like three months, mm -hmm. but I tried to do all the little details that let the people see what I, I'm sorry, I'm having troubles with the connection, but I was saying that I, I'm working a lot on that piece, like three to try to show to the people what I saw there, you know, the little details of the scales and how the scale with the water and with the hand. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder um, what advice could you give to a beginner painter? Well, I think the most important thing is enjoy the painting. You have to enjoy it. 
we don't have to think so much about it, just play with the pain, with the brush. Mm -hmm. So you have to believe in yourself, you know? Um, if you believe that. Okay, great. Uh, I, I know that for everybody of us, COVID was really hard. How was especially COVID for you this time with COVID in terms of painting, in terms of, of, of how was for you? Well, at the beginning it was so hard. I was here in New York. Um, I go back to my country. The art teacher, um, Carmen Sierra, she died because of COVID. That was so sadly. She was also my godmother. So the first months were so hard for me. But after that, I had the opportunity to be there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the Caribbean is my source of inspiration. So I can make a lot of paintings there. I can see a lot of situations like that. So uh, that was so helpful, be there and paint there. But at the same time, it was so sadly for me. Yeah. And I, have a, I just have a final question. Uh, do you know something about humanism? And do you want to mention your ideas about humanism? humanism is too related with the values of the people. So I think that it's the capacity of the people, other person, and try to help them. And that's too related with the values that we have to have. Um, and I think that's so important that we, we ever think about the other and try to help them. So I really appreciate your, your, your visit here tonight. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't know if Robert has a question for, for Luis. No, I just wanted to say thank you, Miguel. I just wanted to say, Luis, I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. I, I, but we appreciate your interview today. It really means a lot to the, the, the humanist family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor for me here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Louis. I just like to say that when we were given this platform to showcase talent, it was a wonderful opportunity. I started off the When the Humanist Attack interviewed me a few years ago, and it was an amazing journey ever since then. And so It is a way of paying for it. So all of the uh, artists that come through our doors, we just really, we're overwhelmed by your genius. And so today I have some great friends that I want to introduce the humanist public. One of those friends is my dear friend, Miguel Anaya. And, and he does have a formal bio and I will, and his bio will be attached to this video, but I want to say about Miguel, Miguel is so multi-talented that 15 minutes can't really consume all the energy that I receive from Miguel when I'm around him. He is a, he is a nurturer, he is a maker, he is a creator of many things. Um, he has a dance background, but he also has a photography background. He has, a, he has a singing background, but I met him on the streets of Harlem near Riverside Drive in an artistic venue. So I'm, I'm so happy for Miguel to be here. Miguel, welcome to When Heminus Attack. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Thank so you. Miguel, we're just gonna yeah. move right into our questions. Miguel, mm -hmm. I have a strong affection for uh, uh, art. I want you to talk about a little bit about your relationship. Where did art start for you? Where does it start for you? Um, well, I think that the closest thing that I can say is my sister was 15 years older than me when I was born, um, having been the first daughter to my mom's first marriage. So she had all these scholastic things that she could order for herself, you know, 
kind of an American thing where you can order whatever books you want, Varnicula to, you know, I don't know, stickers. And she would buy me art supplies or whatever she had lying around. And I would end up picking it up because I was kind of like the only kid um, my age at that time. So I was um, brought up by her. So my understanding was nurtured a lot by what she did. And she was an artist herself. She does mostly jewelry. But she bought me a Norman Rockwell book. And I remember I used to hate it. Um, but then I started to sit down and really look at why I hated it and why I liked other parts of it. And then I realized um, that I just couldn't stop looking at things after that. You know, and um, I just kind of, I would, I would always spend time outside and that always just kind of, I don't know. I just, my mind was, my mind was always talking. So <laughs> maybe, I don't know, maybe that's a whole other subject. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, Miguel. Mm -hmm. I know you've danced with the, the famous Bill T. Jones um, here in New York. I want you to talk a little bit how these different forms of art, how do they interrelate for you? How do they interrelate for you? The, all of the disciplines I'm doing? Yes, yes. Well, I feel that, um, I feel that uh, for the most part, the dancing was something that brought me here. You know, um, coming from a small town, I didn't really expect much from the grant that I got. I knew I was going to Canada. I might learn some dancing, but I didn't really ever think that it would go anywhere. Meaning I didn't even know that there was a job. I didn't even know that there was a scholarship for what I was doing. I just wanted to have fun. And that was the best way to have fun, you know? <clears throat> Um, long story short, because I was dancing with Bill at a very high level, I got injured. And that kind of brought everything to a stop, you know, and it made me have to want to step away from this thing that would cause me pain, which was my body. So I started to think, how can I still achieve this kind of momentum that I've gathered without having to turn back to dance per se and what ha what where else can maybe i look for this kind of you know this kind of energy that i get you know and um photography was something that i started doing and i ended up shooting dance through photography because it was another way to see something and understand it from a different level on my psyche and I think that that made me also want to create because that also opened another door for my my mind and gave it much more of a idea to this instead of a cartoon life that I live in my in my in my head all of a sudden there was like an ability to kind of create like a collage world but with these different tools and then I thought wow so ultimately it's always uh, been about movement in, a, in one way or another. What I mean by that is like movement like of a pen, movement of a chalk, movement of a line, movement of the wind, movement of a leaf, movement of dirt. There's something about that that is choreographed unwillingly. Un, 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 it's just natural. And that is the kind of stuff that I feel in my photography I try to capture because in my dancing, I, I can try to be that, but I don't know that I really convey it the way I want to convey it. And that goes to layers. And I think that that's where the singing has really come in as a graduation to all of that. So I, I, I just trust that all of those um, disciplines and what they've graduated themselves to now, you know, can, can, can create one big heart you know, and, and, and that helps kind of propel forward wherever this 
you know, wherever this is going, because I mean, that's kind of the frightening thing too. Sometimes I wonder, well, am I just jumping from one hot plate to another? <laughs> just because, <laughs> just because, you know, I don't Thank know. You. But, Thank mm. you. I'm going to I'm going to defer to my um, co-host um, Miguel Barrios and ask if he has a question before I ask you my last question, Miguel. Yes, Miguel, I have a question. Uh, so yeah. it, it sounds like you have created a, a bridges between uh, dancing, uh, photography, and singing, um, and um, and you are. Uh, it it seems that that uh, that uh, it has been like a natural path for you to do all of that. Um, I wonder, it's um, mm, right now. How is that process of creation? And that's my first question. And the second one, it's um, uh, how, what advice would you give to somebody who is beginning that nobody, who, somebody who is not having any background in any of those areas that at any age wanna begin to do something like that? Okay. Um, um, I'm gonna have to ask you to repeat the first one a little bit, if you don't mind. The first one is, how do you um, uh, create um, your artwork? How, how is the way how you create that? How, um, because you say that you, you begin with, a, with a, uh, something like a dance and, and then oh. a photography mm -hmm. and then a sing, a sing, something singing. Uh, but uh, where do you go? Do you go to the city? You go uh, outside? I don't know. Um, uh, um, well, uh, you know, during COVID, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, during COVID, dance kind of came to a bit of a stall and you know I don't I've kind of been taking some time off of that just because of my body and you know it, it's just not the same um it's not the same now that I've discovered all these other disciplines because dance was like this for me um but now I'm able to choose what I want to do with that and now I have a job where I can move around and I can sing and so that also frees a lot of my time to paint. Right now I have a lot, a lot of time to paint, a lot of time to just practice. Mostly that's when I do my singing is when I'm painting. It just relaxes me, it helps me hear myself. And um, I don't know, it just that, I don't necessarily have a process. Things just, I think I've just spent so much time working and I'm just very lucky that I get projects here and there and, and you know, I'm willing to put on whatever hat Mm -hmm. to learn more that's the thing it keeps me from getting bored and and just being negative i don't like being negative because it's just it's, life is too long <laughs> right 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 and, and what advice uh or what ideas can you give somebody who has no mm. background in arts maybe somebody young or somebody retiring and who wants to begin uh life in the artwork I think that I think it's really important to um, listen and see around you the people who who want to don't be afraid to share what you want to say is what I'm trying to say because there's going to be people out there who will recognize what you're saying and be able to help you, you know, and I'm hoping to be one of those people. And I think that as I seeing myself as a little boy in Texas, not knowing, you know, what am I going to do? You know, am I just this, you know, strange little kid that, you know, likes to doodle or what, you know, um, but seeing it took one teacher, you know, to, to just make a difference in that sense. And I think that Teachers really are there to help, um, and it just just to um, not let anybody tell you no. Don't anyone tell you no. It takes you. a lot of guts to do what you want. Thank Miguel, you. That was great. That was great. Thank you to both Miguel's. Miguel, Thank I you. have one final question for you, mm -hmm. and this is based on a conversation that you and I had, and it it directly deals with humanism. And this question is a story, a story that you told us, a story that you told us about your mother and the scripture. 
Do you remember that oh. story? Yes. Okay. You remember that story um, that I shared? Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that for us? Sure. Um, so I've been dancing professionally in New York for about 20, 25 years. I've toured for quite an extensive time. I danced with Bill T. Jones. I danced with White Oak Dance Project. I did a bunch of dancing here and there, and it was an amazing experience, especially coming from a border boy who never even studied dance. It's just everything was through scholarship. So I was, I felt I was living a dream, you know. Um, then I got injured. And I, everything changed in my life. I really didn't know where I was going or what I was going to do. I didn't want to go back home. Um, and when I started dancing, I wasn't dancing on large venues anymore. I kind of felt, you know, I was doing whatever was coming so that I could just stay up here to live. And I started to see that I was starting to become very lonely up here um, because I wasn't on tour. And being on tour, you can forget about what you don't have at home. So I did a series uh, where I was working with photography and I thought of myself as kind of a trophy, but even uh, a trophy always sits on the shelf. And so it's kind of like that thing of coming home and having to, you know, be put back on the shelf until they need me again, you know, and really that was kind of a way of me trying to understand what I was feeling. And then once I saw them and I saw how lonely they felt i said well how can i counter that if i can't do that here like presently but how do i do it in my mind what makes me feel that way and when i was younger i wasn't allowed uh, um, to learn spanish in school due to the fact that my english was good because of my older sister as i said earlier um so they said well uh, you know, he can't join in on the Spanish class in class anymore because, you know, we want, we don't want his English to get, you know, kind of messed up or, or whatever weird idea they had. So mom, I had to sit backwards in class to listen. So that would give my mind a lot of imagination because I never got to look at the pictures. And so when I would get home, my mom would read to me from the Bible because that's the only book she ever got to read, meaning her sisters, older sisters, had to teach her because she never went to school. So that's kind of like the one book that she knows and feels comfortable teaching me as a child. So all of that kind of really opened up my mind to um, just just things can get done. And, you know, she always said, I really wish I'd have gone to school. Really, I mean, but I don't know that my life could have ever been or be if it wouldn't have been for that, you know? And it was such a, um, she did what she thought she couldn't do, but she did do it for me. Thank you so much, Miguel. Mm -hmm. I, I am just, I'm overwhelmed by your story. You know, you're so full of wonderful stories and uh, I'm so happy that you're a part of our humanist family. And I, I just really appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. My final guest is a living institution here in New York. He is, you know, I've known him from the very beginning, from the very first time I stepped in New York. And, and there are so many ways to describe a poet. I know so many different types of poets, but I can't really you know, describe him as one singular type of poet. He's been my brother, you know, he's been my friend, he's been my confidant. He's um, given me opportunities over the years. You know, he is a professor, you know, he went to the new school. So, you know, there's so many dimensions about him, you know, and I've seen this evolve over the years because I knew him in the day. You know, we can all say we knew people in the day. I knew him in the day when we ran the streets of New York together in search of our poetic journey. And so I, when he created his own chapbooks from his own hands, which are, and I have them in my possession, which are even much more, um, much more near and dear to me because he has books under his name that are published by presses but I have his original chapbooks that he created when we were on the scene together. 
And so again, he has a huge biography. He's done so many things, not only in New York City, but around the country and around the world. So biography is not, it's only one part of him. And so I'm just gonna give him a chance to come to the stage. Welcome, Thomas, how are you? I am good, thank you so much. What a really kind introduction. Thank you so yeah. much. It's, it's just it's just good because I know you sit on the, this side a lot. So it's just a good, it's a good opportunity to talk to you. So tell us, how are you doing? How are you, how are you living in the poem right now? Uh, how am I living in the poem? Oh, wow. Uh, I'm all right in the poem. A lot of big changes happening in my life right now, personally. So I'm living uh, 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 definitely through the poem. I think it's okay. It's, it's like a seesaw. It's up and down. But I'm, I'm living through it. What, what are some... Because you're always you're so generous. You're always doing. You're always giving. You're always out there in the world. What are some of the things that Thomas wants? What are some of the things that that might not be poetically connected to poetry? Because I know you from the poetry scene. So what are some of the other things that Thomas might want right now? You see, see, that's the thing. I, I, it's all poetry. I, I can't. You know, um, um, I'm I'm in I'm in recovery. So like when. That's all I have. So like, I like doing event, you know, like I'm on the other side, like you said, I'm usually playing Barbara Walters. I'm the one who's usually introducing someone or like, you know, like, and that's kind of like how I cope. And I think that it's just, you know, like I, I teach, it's poetry. It's just, I think it actually probably takes up more of my life than it should, um, especially, um, but, um, there isn't too much more that I want beyond, I guess, stability, but that seems like such a terrible answer. Um, I, I just want to, I guess, keep um, growing more as a person and as a poet. And I think those two things aren't uh, mutually exclusive. So um, yeah, that was a weird answer. I was very, I don't know. I'll tell you, my brother, we're, we're we're growing. We're growing here too. I'm I'm growing yeah. my interviewing skills. So yeah. thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to interview you, Miguel. Do you have a question for Thomas Lucalaro, Miguel? Yes, I have a question. I I I I was reading one of your poems. The the one that is the controlling fear without getting frightened. Yes, um, and I really like it because. Um, uh, you are talking about the elephant in the room, yes. um, and um, uh, so for you, when when you have when you are in trouble to say something to somebody, do you use the poetry or do you use um, the words the simple as they are to say something that you don't like from somebody? I guess I mean that's in terms of communication. I would say, so it's interesting that we're talking about this. So when you're bringing that poem up and stuff, so I, I'm just gonna be honest with everyone. I'm going through like a, a, an eight year separation with someone that's happening within these two weeks. So um, um, I think that I do communicate more through the poem than I do personally. Like that's something that I need to kind of like uh, work through because I find myself commute like, like that poem that you're talking about has to do with some trauma that I dealt with um, in my past. And I'll only deal with it through the poem. Mm -hmm. I won't deal with it. Maybe I won't unpack it with someone. And that, that can get lonely, I guess. Um, um, but it's right now the only way that I think that, um, I mean, I, I started going back to therapy, which is good too. So that's helping as well. Right. Um, um, but um, I think that uh, I'm just trying to, uh, I'm always talking through my poems and that may not be the best move. I think I have to find a way. There's just something that's always uh, like, uh, it, it's always been freeing for me to share. Um, 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 and again, that growth that I mentioned, really, I find growth through that more so than I do with uh, 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 talking one-on-one -on -one, uh, about my feelings, which again is something I have to examine. I feel like right now I'm looking at five, my, five of my therapists. I'm telling you guys, <laughs> like, 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 all right. Now diagnose me in the chat room. 
<laughs> that was great. I'll go into breakout room. <laughs> that was, that was great. <laughs> You're that a was, rich man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was, that was that was hilarious. That was hilarious. But Thomas, you know what I want you to do? Yeah. You know what I want you to do, Thomas? I want you to read us a piece right now. You know, break okay. the idea. Read us a piece. Read us a piece. Sure, sure. My heartbeat wants to be heard. I used to only care about dead poets, the ones who burst forth from the fire, only to become the fire, only to burst forth through me, for everything dead shall rise within me. I used to only care about dead poets, because we are all buried inside ourselves. And when your body is a cemetery, you are never alone because a cemetery is a cemetery because of the lives left in it. There is a storyline here. It starts with depression and it ends in anger. And I can feel the tipping point the beast, the bristle of flame, igniting suicidal emotions, only to realize this suicidal fire is burned for far too long, too open, too cruel. I used to only care about the dead in things, and then came the lithium, and then I used to only stare at the dead in things. And then came the coke. Oh, how I became the dead in things. And then came the soberness. And now I only write about the dead in things. Everyone tells me I look like Robin Williams and I don't know what they're talking about. Everyone tells me I look like Robin Williams and I know exactly what they are talking about. Poets like sad, damaged, and broken down things. I used to only care about dead poets because they are so easy to talk to. Poets like broken, damaged, and sad puppies. But then I look around this Zoom, this light, these Glorious eyes are stars amongst the unraveled tapestry of the universe. And I gotta tell you, I used to only care about dead poets, but it's the ones who are living that are keeping me alive. Thank you. Thomas, that was that was classic Thomas Fukularo. I, I really appreciate you as my brother. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now, I want you to just talk a little bit about humanism and 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 what you feel about humanism for us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, humanism. I, I think it's 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 about. I and mean, you know we were just talking about this before, um, um, and I, I think it's just about growth and self-awareness and knowing how your growth can somehow contribute to someone else's, um, I think is the best way that I was, you know, I've been thinking about that question all week. I'd be like, hmm, how, and, and I think it's just about like, at least on my journey right now, that's all I can think about is like, what do you need? How can I grow? How can I help someone else grow? Um, and that's, that's the only thing right now that I can connect to with that right now. Yeah. And, wow. and red wine. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know what that <laughs> There's some humanism in that too. You know. I, I always appreciate you, my brother. I always remind myself that you, I, Adriana Scopino hung out in Nightingales in the day. We did. We did. I drank a lot. <laughs> <laughs> fun times nightingales yeah yes we hung out at nightingales in the day yeah. miguel yeah. do you have any questions for me um for thomas before we end this yeah. segment no i think i did a question already i guess it's i'm ready i'm, I'm all set yeah i'm fine okay um this section will be just a open forum where the guests and the co-host will just discuss current issues or current concerns i just like to ask the guests there have been here in Brooklyn and around the country, there have been birds falling out of the sky. There have been birds falling out of the sky. I recently walked across 
from the library here at Grand Army Plaza on my way home and a bird fell right in front of me. And um, I was very saddened by that. I was very saddened by that. And so um, there, are, there are major environmental concerns. I am an, an environmental activist. It always comes up in my work. And I just wanna, I wanna hear the concerns of our guest audience about what do you feel about, uh, how does your work speak to the environment and what are your feelings towards the environment right now? Well, I can speak for mine because I think I use a lot of animals in my work, imagery. Um, you know, when I was a little boy, I was not given a, uh, a kind of like a BB gun. I wanted a BB gun, you know, all my uncles had guns, everybody had guns. <laughs> but my dad said, you don't, you don't need an instrument to take anything away that doesn't belong to you. And that was a really big lesson for me. And ever since um, I learned uh, how beautiful, you know, everything is, it just kind of made that kind of one of my priorities is to take care of innocent things, you know? And that's one thing I always try to uh, educate myself a lot on, you know? I watch a lot of um, documentaries and things like that on things that are going on around with the environment and especially with animals, I'm like a big animal lover. Sorry, that was it. Awesome. Uh, and Luis, what do you think? Or, or, or Thomas, what do you think? Oh, I, I agree, you know, that's so important. And a lot of birds, because of that, have some birds that are endemic from Colombia. We just have those kind of birds and they are in danger. So I thank them, say to the people that's too important, take care of them. Um, and also to show what beautiful they are being free in, the, in our forest or any landscape. So I think that's so important uh, and it's so important too that we are talking now about that because the people have to be conscious about the environment. Um, you know, I, I, um, I'll jump in on this really quickly. I just a, an idea that I had. You know, you said there's birds falling out the sky, right? And before, when I was a kid, I used to always look at um, kind of the penaches that the uh, Aztecs made and all the artwork that's done with birds. And I always feel bad, you know, that they killed these animals when I was a kid. But now, you know, it's on a much larger scale worldwide and nobody's collecting the feathers. <laughs> They're just killing them. <laughs> I don't know. It's, um, yeah, exactly. it's, it's yeah. interesting. And, and Thomas, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know how much more I could add to what's been said. I, I, you know, thinking about animals and, you know, people don't really see past what is right in front of them. So, you know, like, I think people care more about cats and dogs uh, and just the environment and what that uh, entails. I, I, um, you know, I, 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 I think it's just a scary time. And there just still just seems to be like uh, no onus on, you know, the onus feels like it's on us all the time, um, which it should be, absolutely. But there seems to be a, a, a in terms of corporations and the, the that onus seems to, um, you know, I, I'll never get, you know, it's like, um, like supermarkets, you know, um, I, I'm going on a tangent now or something else because, uh, I think about this all the time and, and Robert actually did a, a reading with me uh, uh, where we dealt with the environment, uh, human impact Institute. And, um, and there's, and one of the things we were trying to figure out are like, you know, how supermarkets are banning, you know, plastic bags, but how much pla you know, like how much plastic are in supermarkets, like the packaging, like the plastic bags are just this, like, okay, so now we're inconvenienced. And we've got to pay five cents, but no one's inconvenienced within 
like what the corporations are actually producing within those supermarkets. And that to me is just like, I, I, I don't, I, I don't understand sometimes it, it, it scares me. Um, um, and I can't wrap my head around that sometimes. How do you know that? <laughs> I, so, I have a quick, uh, oh, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. It's um, uh, for all three panelists it's, uh, and guests. I want to to know what the schools should teach about humanism uh, for 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 children, for teenagers. What what should should they learn in about humanism? I, I guess it's like because um, it I, right now in schools they teach religion. And, people, and students learn about religion, but it's very just maybe just a few schools teaching about humanism. So when humanism begins to be like a trend, like more more um, common to, to teach about what schools should teach to them, what what kind of things you think that would be important to, to teach in a school. It's a very, I don't know, no, I mean, it, it, I mean, it would be great. You should have more art. That's like the biggest humanism teacher you can have because it's so, un, it can be catered to so many different things. Just everyone that can learn it and how they need to learn it. So we're so linear now with learning things, you know, not everybody learns the same, but actions, um, that's how we learn as humans. You know, we can learn about it all we want on books, but it's about, you know, helping somebody. It's about helping people. That's all it is. It's not that hard, you know. It's just it becomes such a hard subject to talk about because we're so selfish. Yes, I understand, yeah. Thank um, you. What do you I see? have one Thank final you. question. I have one final question um, to our Oh, sorry, Tom. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that because I definitely think art, writing, like, you know, there's social and emotional learning that I think kind of gets outside of what uh, uh, um, education should be. Um, so I think that that's such a great way to not only like have students doing it, but students talking about it why they did it. I, I, I teach these poetry workshops and it's not about just editing their work. It's about knowing the why after it and like them talking through their feelings. And, you know, I, I can't say that that happens with a paint. I, I would imagine happens with a painting or a photograph too, where you're, you're talking through your feelings through it. And I think that really adds to the humanism element. Uh, I, I really believe that. And I also think, I'm sorry. I yes, just want to add something. I also that that can help them to understand the other people, and that's so important. Be so respectful and understand the difference of the others, and the art is a way. Thank you. One final question for the three of you. Thank you so much. I think that each one of you are geniuses in your own right. Two things that I want to share with you recently. Well, I I I uh, I share a project with my friend Vincent. We do a, a, a project called Book to Prisoners Project, where we'll go around the neighborhood and pick up books every Wednesday and mail them to certain prisons around the United States. That's one thing I want to say. But I also want you to I want any one of you to discuss the disappearance of a book of the disappearance of a book and how important you think a book is in society still. And also, I recently picked up a gig tutoring once a week. And what this, the little student told me was that they are getting rid of writing in their school. And I, 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 at first, I didn't understand what he meant, but he meant actually writing. All his assignments has to be typed. So I want you to talk a little bit about what you feel about this occupational therapeutic thing of holding a pencil or a pen in your hand and writing how, what kind of effect do you think that will have on our future society, our future humanism and the disappearance of a book? Anyone can chime in, please. Disaster. 
sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I don't see. Um, I don't know. In a way, I don't see that moving forwards. I see that moving backwards. I mean, it. I, I think everything has a place, but you know, we don't even really shake hands anymore with people. We really don't hug people anymore. Like we're losing all of that, and now we're gonna lose writing. I mean. <laughs> strange it's a it's a very weird thing maybe i'm a romantic for the old i don't know when they when you say writing do you mean uh handwriting as opposed yeah. to typing? Hand, yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. i mean no, just, yeah mm -hmm. you know it's 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 like a you know there's such I think we're all, and I, I don't presume to speak for everyone, we're all at an age where we both are in the middle of the technology age, but also like the moleskin uh, uh, book or notebook that we would write in. And there's a difference in how I write like this, as opposed to like this. And for me, the movement is so much more freeing it's like a conductor or something. I don't know. I feel very rigid when I'm like that. But that's also, I process information differently. There are other people who are so good at the keyboard that that is their piano. You know, that's all I have to say. Interesting word. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's so hard to, to think about it. Um, but I, I agree, you know, I enjoy more gripe and... Um, and all the movement that you were talking about, I think that says more. I was going to say for the artists, do you feel a difference like with when you're doing it with your hands? Do you guys do like graphic art, like through computer? Is there something different? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I mean, even, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a novice compared to Luis in that sense you know I mean I don't I couldn't tell you history of you know why you would paint one way or another or if there's even a you know what would define that um but I think uh for oh god I totally forgot because I went into the painting thing sorry <laughs> <laughs> you asked about painters feeling what no, 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 just like, is there, you know, like thinking about like writing and doing on the computer. Oh, yeah. Is there a different like feeling with that too? Like same thing with art? Uh, as if you're doing graphic design on a computer as opposed to painting or doing something with your hands. What does it feel like yeah. you're speaking the same muscles? You, I think for me, you'd get to move a lot faster on the computer um, because I can, you know, I can very easily move around, but when I'm actually painting by hand, um it's just it, it's it, it's about it's about taking your time if not then it's not you're not doing anything i mean i you're doing work if i'm sitting in front of the computer doing something like that my the way that my i need to breathe the way i need to be holding a pen doesn't really match up with kind of the work i would make online does that make sense yeah yeah it's completely different but I prefer doing it with my hands. Yeah, yeah. I, I like, I like, you know, I like getting paint on my hands. I really like it. <laughs> well, I think we open up to the universe some great questions that 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 lead to further discussion. And again, I'm Robert Gibbons, Miguel Barrios, and I co-host this show once a month. We encourage you to tell people about us. We're trying to expand our programming. We thank the organization, uh, the organization When Humanists Attack for having us. Thank you, Chris, for helping us through this today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for showing up and, and sharing, sharing with us all your thoughts and ideas and, and, um, and your answer the questions that, that were really enlightening for, for, for us in this moment. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay. Well, really Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I will be performing in January in Sleep No More. We start um, rehearsals in January, and we'll be performing in February. So that's a 
that's a year contract kid so get your tickets <laughs> yeah thomas does, stuff, thomas does stuff all the time maybe he can put in maybe he can share with us and we can share some of his work he does a monthly he does a, a monthly a 10 minute show and he also does a weekly uh a, a monthly show am i right thomas it's weekly everything's yep. weekly unfortunately uh -huh, yeah. yeah so he does a weekly show and he does a 10 minute show once a month i think so you can share cool. that with our community too and we'll we'll try to share it with them and, and Luis, uh, any shows coming? Any show is coming? Yeah, in January, I will have a, a show at the league. In January 24 is the opening. So wow. we are in that. Right. Awesome. Great. I will tell you, Luis, you know, I took classes at the Art Students League. I love that place. I love that place. I've taken classes there. I love that place. It's an amazing place. Thank you to all of our, our, our wonderful geniuses tonight. Thank you to Luis Romero. Thank you to Miguel Anaya. And thank you to my dear brother, Thomas Fucolaro. This is uh, a labor of love for us. We thank the production staff, the people that are behind the scenes that put this together, the people that will, the, the artists that will take this with them on their journey, wherever they end up. We want you to remember us. We want you to also promote Subscribe to the when, when Humanist Attack channel. You know, tell your friends about us. Um, we've had a great time making this podcast and this video for you. And feel free to comment and look at the podcast and the video when it when it when it comes up and um, be, become available for you. Thank you.